So we ended Thursday talking about union with Christ, where this is the this is the spiritual reality that occurs when a person becomes a believer, and that everything else reflects this reality. Right? So now we're going to talk about this is the reality. This is what ha actually happens to a person. Um, now we're going to talk about the two kind of ramifications on the other side of this reality, which are sanctification and glorification. So sanctification is just the idea that believers are regenerated, that we are becoming more like God. We're becoming more holy as time progresses. Um, everybody here, most Christians throughout history, believe in a progressive sanctification. That it doesn't happen immediately, even though we're involved with the Holy Spirit, even though our, our status uh, before God goes up to, I've used this image before, right? Where when we get saved, we are made righteous before God. So we are instantly brought up to here, right? But our, our holiness in this regard, does not go up to 100, right? It is much more, um, we would say digital, right? This is analog. This is up or down. You are either righteous before God or you're not. This does not depend on this, right? So this, you can be at 50%. 50% uh, sanctified. Hopefully, you're, you're better than you were a month ago, right? And hopefully, a month from now, you're better than you are today. Right? And this goes back and forth and up and down and everything else. But this does not go up to 100 until heaven. And this does not go up to 100 when we hit 100 on justification. Right? Maybe I'll write them up here just so we see. So... This aspect of sanctification, I think several of our papers that we're working on have to do with this. The idea of um, if we are justified, what does it mean when our sanctification is lacking? Right? I think one of our papers is about that kind of specifically. I think yours might talk on that a little. Yours might talk on that a little. This idea of if, if we make bad choices and we you know, relapse or we stumble or struggle in our sanctification – does that at some point call into question our justification, right? Um, or to put it in other terms, if somebody says that they're a believer, somebody says that they have been justified, but their sanctification is still way down here for years and years, at some point, do we question this, right? They say, oh, you know, you anybody who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I call on the name of the Lord. So, you know, when I was eight, I wrote my name down in a Bible, so I'm saved even though my life is not changed at all, right? So at some point, we might say, okay, but are you submitted to God in obedience? Are you actually being sanctified? Because being sanctified is evidence that the Holy Spirit is in you, regenerating you, right? So we are in this gradual process of becoming more holy, which will culminate um, in heaven. Right In heaven, we will be made perfect. We will be made holy. And the way that it functions, uh, I don't know that it says on this slide, who is it that's doing this in the believer? The Holy Spirit. So that when we, you know, hey, I realize today I'm, I'm better at such and such a, a sin than I was a year ago. You know, I'm not as I'm not as angry of a person as I was. I'm not as worried as I was a year ago. I'm not as whatever it is. We attribute that to the Holy Spirit, so that we don't get the credit for it. So we don't, you know, pat ourselves on the back. Oh, good job! I'm not as bad as I used to be. It's because I'm so great, right? The Holy Spirit gets the credit for it, which returns the the glorification of God, right? God is doing the work. Just like he's doing the work for our justification, he's also doing the work for our sanctification, right? For the purpose of removing boasting from us. Uh, Paul talks about this a lot with justification. God saves us unilaterally, right? Jesus saves us and puts us at 100 so that when we get to heaven, we don't boast. And I think the Holy Spirit is functioning in the same way. So that when we are better people than we used to be, 
it's because of the Holy Spirit. Um, there's a couple of views on sanctification. I think we've talked about this a bit, where um, for Catholicism, a lot of a lot of sanctification is is part of the process of being a Catholic, going through the sacraments and being a member and being in the the ritualistic calendar, right? Of going to confession, receiving communion, participating in the community. Um, but they have a scale that we probably don't include. So we have, we would emphasize as Protestants the idea that like all of us are saints, right? We're all of the priesthood of believers, we're all saints, all these things. Catholics don't really have that uh, they don't agree with that. Uh, that came out of the Reformation. Where they would say people that are particularly holy, people that are particularly virtuous, can uh, become saints. And there's a whole process they have to go through. The saint has to, after they die, they have to have been credited with performing miracles posthumously. Right? Did we talk about this with Mother Teresa? So Mother Teresa died 15 years ago? Something like that? Um... So pretty quickly after she died, she was put up for sainthood. Somebody nominated her. I don't know how the, that process works. But she is, they evaluate her life. Was she Catholic? You have to be Catholic to be a saint. Um, did she, you know, uh, perform all the sacraments that she was required to? Did she do these things? So they check those boxes, and then they wait. And her, her kind of file is put on hold until, I don't know why, just that, um, until... Mother Teresa is credited with performing miracles posthumously after she died. So say we are say we're Catholic and we're struggling with something and we need help, we say, you know, so and so has cancer, we need them cured. So we would pray to Mother Teresa to help. Um, and if the person is cured, then Mother Teresa is credited with that miracle. All right. Wow. And so once she performs two posthumous miracles, then she is venerated as a saint. So that happened pretty quickly for Mother Teresa. Um, okay. I assume because so many people are like praying to her and trying to credit her with miracles that you know, of the thousand people that put up petitions, two of them got answered, and so she became a saint. Does that make sense, that process? Um, they also have this idea of the beatific vision. Has anybody heard of this before? Does that have anything to do with the Beatitudes? Um, it's based on the same root word. Um, so the Beatitudes are, uh, actually, off the top of my head, I can't think of the word. Um, but it's, uh, uh, what are the Beatitudes? Um, like the fullness, the wholeness, the... the All of them combined. Well, no, so this is, it's based on the same word, but it doesn't really mean the same thing. Okay. It is, um, <clears throat> it's a full vision of God. It's a whole vision of God. So um, you'll see this in like, uh, there's like a fascinating subject of uh, Catholic mysticism. So Catholics who will pray until they reach like a state of ecstasy. And they reach that state through the beatific vision. They see God and they have this um, you know, spiritual experience. And within Catholicism, that is based on reaching higher levels of holiness and uh, vir virtuosity. Um, being particularly holy, being particularly virtuous, um, so you think of like a nun being super virtuous, she can achieve that state of actually seeing a vision of God uh, through the process of sanctification. That's kind of what it leads to within Catholicism. We, this is all kind of very strange to us, I think. We don't really operate in these categories. Um, but now that I'm thinking about it, I'm going to skip ahead a little um, if I can find it. It reminds me of, so I'm skipping way ahead actually, um, these like Pentecostal and charismatic movements within the holiness movement. So we'll kind of place it in a second. But this idea of having um, extremely spiritual experiences through the Holy Spirit, um, kind of in the same movement of being pious, being virtuous, being uh, holy to the point where you are having these 
uh, inexplicable experiences. The Holy Spirit comes upon you and does these things. Um, Catholicism has been doing that for um, centuries. But we'll get into this and what this looks like in a minute. Um, but it's sort of along the same lines as this. I think we are more familiar with this, generally speaking, than we are with like saints achieving ecstasy in the beatific vision. That's a little more foreign to us. This is more normal, I think. Um, let's see, we'll skip that. Let's look at Protestants. So I think this is kind of the, the main idea within the Reformation in general, uh, Lutheranism specifically, but the idea that a believer is both justified and sinner. Right? That we are righteous before God, but we are still a sinner. We're still in a corrupt body. We still have a corrupt spirit. We still do things we shouldn't do. Um, the idea that he emphasizes, though, because you always have to be careful to say, oh, well, I'm justified, so it doesn't matter what this looks like. It doesn't matter if I'm not being sanctified. Because I'm justified, I can do whatever I want. Right? That's a pretty common response. And Luther fights back against that and argues, first, that that's not the case. Second, he would say, being, being made more sanctified, being made more holy, does not affect this at all. Right? And so, because people get into the other end of, well, I'm going to do more good things in order to earn this. And that's kind of what Catholicism was like during Luther's time, was performing the rites and trying to earn justification. And so Luther is fighting against that and saying, no, our sanctification is motivated only by love and gratitude toward God for saving us. So God brings us up to here, and in response to that, we work and try to get higher up on this ladder. And when we do, when we take an extra step and get better at it, we attribute it to the Holy Spirit. Um... But the idea that we can climb this ladder ourselves to eventually get on this ladder is, is fictitious. Um, I think this is a helpful image because it's two different ladders. No matter how high you think you climb on this ladder, you can never get over on this ladder. Right? Um, and so I think that's the main point that Luther is trying to make. Uh, he talks about the law and he talks about what the purpose of the law. I think we've talked about this in this class in the past. Of Paul has this understanding of the law as an external force that is oppressive because it's in, impossible to fulfill. The law meaning like Torah, the Old Testament, right? Uh, that Paul would say that the law is good and holy and given from God, but it's an external force that is, that is I'll use the word, inflicted upon us and we as sinners cannot fulfill it. And so Paul, uh, at least as a Christian looking back, uh, understands himself to be oppressed by this law that he's an, incapable of fulfilling. Right? It's not that the law is wrong, it's that the law is giving him rules that he cannot follow. And it, it reveals to him how sinful he is. Right? Now on the other side, once he gets saved, that does not mean that he discounts the law. Now that I'm saved, I can ignore what the law says. Paul says, no, now that I'm saved, I actually have the ability to fulfill the law. That Now that I'm saved, I have a new heart, and that new heart comes with the desire to fill the law and the ability to do it. Right? So not that we will actually get all the way up on this scale, that we will get better, and that we have an ability to do it that we never had before because we're empowered by the Holy Spirit. Good? Um... He goes through, and I think we see this in our in the textbook. So we see the different kind of ranges in Protestantism, right, in the, the chapter in the book. So I don't know that we really need to spend a lot of time on it. Um, different denominations have different views of, of sanctification is pretty much what this comes down to. These are just summaries of the different sections in our book. Um, I thought there was something to focus on. Um, when we talk about Pentecostalism and the charismatic movement, in my understanding, in my, in my estimation, both of those come out of Wesleyanism. 
right? So Wesleyanism starts this kind of holiness movement, and um, the Pentecostal movement, the charismatic movement generally, come from that holiness movement. Does that make sense? Like historically, they kind of branch out of that. Pentecostalism is the denomination. This is where you have like uh, United Pentecostals, the AG, this sort of stuff. Um, these are the, the actual denominations that belong to this. The charismatic movement is more broad. It's kind of a response that went into most denominations uh, in response to the Pentecostal movement. So the Pentecostal movement started uh, emphasizing the Holy Spirit, uh, particularly um, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And other denominations became more charismatic in response to this. Does that make sense? It's like how after the Reformation, the Catholic Church reformed itself also. Right? It changed because it agreed with some of Luther's arguments. They just didn't think that Luther should have left the church because of it. Right? So they still said, like, we're not going to do papal indulgences anymore. They still made that reform, uh, even though they didn't become Protestant. Does that make sense? So the same thing. Uh, so there are, there's charismatic Catholics, uh, particularly in like South America which is very interesting. Um, like, they, they will go to Mass, they will go to confession, they receive communion, and then they, like, fall out in the Spirit. Um, which is very... It's not what we think of as Catholicism at all. Um, but it is, it's Catholicism uh, influenced by this charismatic movement that's in a lot of other branches. Right? We kind of see it in our worship services even now, where our worship services are more charismatic than they were 100 years ago. Right? Um, more influenced by the Holy Spirit, more open to the Holy Spirit doing things and moving things and changing during the service, that is all part of this movement. Good? All this to say, what does this have to do with sanctification? Um, the gift of the Holy Spirit, the, the being influenced by the Holy Spirit is an aspect of sanctification. Right? So, when I became a Christian, I became a Christian in a Pentecostal movement. Um, and after you get saved, people start telling you about speaking in tongues, right? You should go and you should get, you know, people should lay hands on you and you should pray and the Holy Spirit will make you speak in tongues. Um, but part of that was also, um, if you don't, like if you come down and you pray to speak in tongues and you don't, then maybe you're not really sanctified. Like maybe you are, maybe you have some secret sin that you need to address, before God will give you that gift, right? And that was always kind of, I mean, some people said it out loud. It was always kind of under the, it was, it was like whispered, but some people, I mean, flat out said it from the pulpit. Uh, like, if you don't speak in tongues, it's because of this. And so there's some connection here of this Holy Spirit baptism and being empowered by the Holy Spirit um, is part of this process of sanctification. Um, the idea is, uh, the way it's described to me was, when you get saved, um, the Holy Spirit goes into you. And when this happens, when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, you go into the Holy Spirit. And so you are kind of fully immersed in the Holy Spirit instead of just having it as a part of you. You are, you are surrounded by it. Um, and so it's a new power. It's a new filling, whatever it is. And that aspect of being baptized in the Holy Spirit increases your ability to be sanctified to see people the way God sees them, to respond to them charitably, to become more like Christ to other people. Good? Go ahead. So how do they feel about the Christians or other beliefs that speaking in tongues is like a thing? Or like it's not a thing, you know what I mean? Um, it's kind of a big thing that some churches are like, we don't speak in tongues. And stuff. I mean, yeah, there's, so there's, uh, denominations that are charismatic, like we're talking about. Um, and by charismatic, I mean they believe that the gifts of the Holy Spirit are practiced in that. So they'll be laying on of hands for healing. They'll do anointing the sick with oil. They will speak in tongues. They'll prophesy. They'll do all these things. There are other denominations. I'm never going to spell this right. Cessationists. I think it's a T. Is that a T? Yeah. I was going to say that doesn't look right. Um, I actually don't think that looks right either. So, <laughs> um, They believe that the gifts of the Holy Spirit cease after the apostolic age. So Acts, 
the book of Acts is full of gifts of the Holy Spirit. It happens everywhere, right? But they would argue, uh, so like speaking in tongues, for example. In the book of Acts, speaking in tongues is always used as a mechanism to identify a new group becoming part of the church. So Peter speaks in tongues, right? And then chapters later, Cornelius comes and gets him and says, hey, I need you, to, I had a vision, I need you to tell me what's going on. So Peter comes and preaches the gospel to Cornelius, a Gentile, and what happens to Cornelius when he believes? He speaks in tongues. So Peter goes back to Jerusalem and argues with the Jewish Christian believers, hey, God is doing something. Because there's this Gentile over here, has nothing to do with Judaism, has never converted to Judaism, has no interest in converting to Judaism. I told him about Jesus. He believed in Jesus, and the Holy Spirit filled him the same way he filled us. So maybe you don't have to become Jewish to believe in Jesus. And the speaking in tongues throughout the book of Acts is the agent that that unifies the church. Does that make sense? So these folks would say that was a specific time period while the apostles were alive to, so when uh, whoever it is, all the apostles are attributed with going to different places and starting to, one of them goes to India, I don't remember who, um, but so-and-so goes to India and starts preaching the gospel and what happens to Indians when they believe? They are baptized in the Holy, I shouldn't be pointing at this, they are baptized in the Holy Spirit. Right? They start speaking in tongues. And the argument is it proves that the gospel is for everyone, that the Holy Spirit is for everyone, and that they are all united in Christ. These folks will argue that stops after the apostles are all dead because it's no longer necessary. The, the, the role of the Holy Spirit in that specific function of performing physical outward gifts is no longer necessary um, to perpetuate the gospel because the gospel is already spreading, everybody already is aware of it, or everybody, you know, it's already spread enough to enough other people that we don't need it anymore. And so they would say, now there's no such thing as speaking in tongues. They would say, when Paul is talking about, you know, utterances in my soul, he's talking about like private prayer by himself. He's not talking about standing in a congregation and speaking in a, a, another language that nobody understands. Um, so they would say that those things just don't happen. Um, I think these folks would look at the, the more Pentecostal folks and say, you're making it up. It's not really the Holy Spirit. You're just doing it because you've heard other people do it. Mm -hmm. um, I think that would be their response is, you're just making it up. Go ahead. One, okay. <laughs> I was going to say, like, what would they say to, like, Paul saying that, um, what, basically what you said, but also, like, what about, I mean, I guess about, like, the, I think it's First Corinthians, like, there's some, like, if I speak in the tongues of men and angels or whatever, would they, would they say, like, oh, that's just, like, hypothetical or something? Yeah. That's interesting. But then also, it, like, makes me think about, like, people who have, like, never heard anyone, like, speak in tongues and then, like, speak in tongues themselves. Like, I don't know, because that happened to me. Like, I never really, like, heard anyone, like, speak in tongues or anything. It's, like, not that I'm, I'm not, like, copying people. <laughs> so, I don't know. I just think, like, that's... Interesting. <laughs> I think some of them will say, uh, I don't know if it would fall in the <laughs> cessationist, because there's, there's people in the middle who will say that um, the Holy Spirit still operates in these ways, but not the way that these folks do it. Nope. So, yeah. so go ahead. Oh, my, my bad. This is the topic you made as like. Yeah. Because you're, you're, you're from like a Pentecostal background, right? Yes. Yeah. So, so they, they take issue with like, <laughs> Somebody standing up during a worship service and speaking in tongues, and then in the in the movement in the denomination, you you can't really proceed until somebody interprets the tongues. Yeah, like that's part of the rules or whatever. Um, but because the idea is that if I stand up and speak, I'm I'm going to use the term, but I don't mean it offensively. If I if I'm speaking gibberish, right? Where and by that I mean a language that none of you know. If I stand up and speak in gibberish, it doesn't do anything for anybody. It doesn't edify anybody. But if you stand up and interpret my gibberish in the way that I meant it, and now you know what I said and you're translating it into English for everybody, then I'm edified because we both know, that both of us are agreeing that what I said was from God because God gave you the interpretation. So he gave me the tongues and gave you the interpretation, and now all of us are on board that that's what's happening. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But there's so many times where someone will stand up 
and speak in tongues and then interpret themselves <laughs> and then sit down. And so there's people in the middle who will say, you're laughing because it, it, it happens. Yes, and then it happens a lot. And come up and do the exact same thing. <laughs> yes. Sounds. Yes. That, yeah. that person was saying, and it would be a completely different. Yes. Like, oh my goodness. But the, 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 hear it right the argument <laughs> is, um, yeah. yeah, me too. Uh, <laughs> the, the argument is that if it is the Holy Spirit, then it wouldn't be the same person doing it. Right? Right. Because the Holy Spirit can give prophecy it's too. It's and so you don't need the tongues if it's just the one person. You can just stand up and say, I've received a word from the Lord, here it is in English. Yeah. You don't need the tongues in order to achieve the result. Yeah. The purpose of the tongues is to edify the group as proof that the Holy Spirit is there. Okay? I've heard stories, I've never experienced it um, uh, firsthand. I've heard stories of people who find themselves uh, with people who do not speak the same language. So somebody ups and ends up in Japan, and the Holy Spirit tells them to go somewhere, and they're interacting with these people who do not speak English, they don't speak Japanese, and the Holy Spirit gives them Japanese. And they proclaim the gospel to these people in you know perfect Japanese. And the people respond, and they're saved. That, I think, is different than what we're talking about when we're talking about yeah. speaking in tongues, right? Um, these people would still say that does not happen. Right? These are kind of hardliners on, on this side. Mm -hmm. Pentecostals would be kind of on, on this far side over here. I'll write you know, AG or uh, UPC on this side. There are folks in the middle right, who will say, these folks are using the Holy Spirit incorrectly. They have gifts of the Holy Spirit, and they're using them wrongly. Um, and there are people in the middle who will say, the Holy Spirit moves and does things, but it doesn't look like this. And it's not that he's not doing anything. Right? And they will very much take a middle position of, um, you know, yeah, the Holy Spirit gives you speaking in tongues for yourself in your room when you don't know what to pray for. Then you are overwhelmed by the Spirit and you speak in tongues by yourself, and that is the Holy Spirit praying directly to God on your behalf and, and just moves you out of the way so that it's praying as accurately as possible for your needs. Right? That's kind of a middle of the road approach. Uh, it's something that happens, but it has these specific circumstances. Does that make sense? Good. Okay. I looked it up. It is. It is cessationist. Yeah, I looked it up too. <laughs> um, I will. I will say another argument for what you're talking about with um, <coughs> Paul and my speaking with tongues and men and angels. Yeah. <coughs> One of the arguments I've heard. Is that he's using exaggerated rhetorical questions? Yeah, that's what I that's, that's what I meant. Yeah, I, I kind of figured, but I wasn't really. Yeah. yeah. But then, but then the like first Corinthians fourteen doesn't make any sense to me then because he says like, for I know who speaks in tongues does not speak to people but to God. Indeed, no one understands them. They yeah. under utter mysteries by the Spirit. So it's like I don't, I don't know how you can say like, oh, he's not speaking or like. Yeah. If no one understands him, but then he also says, like, now, brothers and sisters, if I come to you and speak in tongues, what good will I be to you unless I bring some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or word of instruction? Right. So it's like, if you're um, arguing that um, speaking in tongues, which I do think that speaking in tongues can be, like, to people that, like, speak another language that, like, you don't speak. But if, well, why is Paul, like, doing it in the church if... Yep. If they don't understand. But he says, it is pointless for me to come up That's and speak true. gibberish to you, yeah. because none of you will understand it. Yeah. So it would be better for you if I just speak in the, in the vernacular yeah. that we all understand, and then we can be edified. Yeah. But that does imply that there are some times when that happens, yeah. right? Um, and he says, I think, in one of those passages of like, to some have been given tongues, and to others yeah. prophecy, and yeah. to others whatever. Um, but these folks would argue, yeah, in Paul's time... That's what was happening. But then it stopped, conveniently, I think, after mm -hmm. anything was written. Right after the New Testament was done being written, all of this stopped. Um, I will say, I have a... I take issue with folks who, who use terminology like, God told me such and such. Because... Um, because if you're wrong, you're blaspheming. Right? I mean, like, by definition, you're lying about God. Um, I experience this a lot on more of this side of the equation of 
people, we would use terminology like, um, you know, I have something impressed, God put something on my heart, I have something impressed on me, or whatever it is, which kind of <laughs> softens that language. Yeah. But the language of like, God told me such and such, is very difficult. Because when you're saying that, you're saying that what you're about to tell me is equivalent to the Bible. Right? Yeah. That I've got this text that is the words of God recorded by human beings, that's breathed out by the Holy Spirit and recorded. And he, decided to do something. And he told you something, and what you're about to tell me is equivalent to the Holy Spirit inspired Bible. No. And most of the time I just don't I don't buy it. Go ahead. What about a nudge? Yeah, that's a way to soften the language. And that just the word not just softening the language. Yes. <laughs> to say I because I've been because nudged, even if you say like that God loves them, I get a nudge yeah. and I'm looking yeah. at the person you go and right. I say, I want you to know that God loves you. But yes. But even if you even if you said that and you said God God told it, me to it's tell hard. You. But if you say, God told me to tell you this, yeah. then that's different than saying, like, I think God wants me to tell you something. Yeah. Yeah. Because then you're putting yourself in the position where if you're wrong, it's about you. Think about the Old Testament. What happens when a prophet is wrong in the Old Testament? They die. They, they are the killed. Us. They are taken outside of the city and stoned to death for blasphemy. Mm -hmm. Because they made a prophecy and they were wrong. Right? And, and that's kind of what we're talking about. It is that level of you're claiming things on God that are not accurate. Um, so I, I'm always a fan of softening it with, I think God wants me to tell you something. Yeah. Yeah. Or I have, let me tell you this verse, right? I want to share this, this verse from the Bible with you that says that God loves you, right? Um, which I think is better than, well, I speak to God. Yeah. And God told me... <laughs> Things for you because then that makes that only I've heard that too. it elevates you, yeah. I think, but it also makes the person dependent upon you, mm -hmm. right? Their relationship with God is now dependent upon you being the the interpreter, which is not helpful. Instead, you can say, "I I have can I share something with you, right? Can I can I read this passage from the Bible with you? I think God has something for you here, and you read them, and then that connects them with God through His Word, right?" And then the, the Bible is the conduit that initiates their relationship with God, right? Go ahead. So last time I went to, Pentecost, to, a, to a Pentecostal church. Okay. Just because, you know, I don't know, a lot of my family just decided, hey, let's, 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 sure. let's go real quick. Last time I went to a Pentecostal church, they called us up to the front because they'd never seen this day before at that church. Ouch. Mm -hmm. I got a beard and, and, and you know, I, the tattoo, the, and all this stuff. So they never seen this day before. My wife has makeup on. So they call us up to the front because they said they want to pray for us. Uh huh. They start praying for Look us. Look at these sinners. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. They start praying for us. Us, maybe like a group of six or seven of them are all just wailing away. Yeah. In their gibberish. Yeah. Can you just I, take your skin off, please. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yes. Like yeah. 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 Really. Yeah. And I was just sitting just, just there, and they're like, hey, do you want to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior? And I was just like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I already have. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah. Well, you know, God is telling me that you need to do it again. Uh-huh. Oh, um, uh, nope, no, nope. Yeah. And then they look at my wife, and she has a black blouse on, black skirt, uh -huh. black heels. God tells me that you need to throw away all your black clothes. No. You wear too much black. Huh. I wonder why that. Yeah, that's so weird. Yeah. That's the kind of Yeah. And see, that, that is what that, that is what I face. dislike primarily about yeah. this is that it it puts the the person in the position of God. Yeah. yeah. To say like, oh, you're doing things that I find culturally unacceptable, so I'm going to say that God is mm -hmm. telling me that you're wrong. And that I just extremely common. In the part, part of part of my argument, and, and this is because I'm a, I'm a prideful person. I like to be able to argue. <laughs> right? And and if you and I come together and say, all right, here's the rule book, right? Any answer is in here, and we're going to argue until we figure out the right answer. But these are the rules, right? We can't because it, for for me, as like I want to have the debate, I want to argue. When you say, well, God told me, it's like, well. I can't argue with that. Yeah. Like I that's not in here. So I can't I can't respond to that. You've ended the conversation because you're pulling the trump card, right? And the trump card is well God told me this is how it is. I'm like I don't 
I don't believe you because that's not how it is in here, right? And I know this is what God said, and but I'm not convinced that God told you something different, right? Um, but that's probably yeah. because I'm prideful and I have the heart. <laughs> I just think um, like um, it's so important to like be careful like yeah. about that stuff. I, that like that's how <laughs> I yeah. feel is like <laughs> that doesn't like those things like don't make anyone like better than anyone else like let's say right. like i speak in tongues or like i've been like baptized with the holy spirit or something like that doesn't make me better than you right it doesn't make me like higher than you or something i feel like you get right. into a really like really really dangerous territory when you start doing stuff like that and i just don't think that like honors the lord and then right. it makes me sad i think that's how most denominations or sects or groups are they, they all have something that leads themselves toward pride. Whether you're in this movement where it's, you know, I've been baptized in the Holy Spirit and I do these things and God speaks through me, or, you know, what we were talking about weeks ago with uh, Calvinism, right? There's, there's branches of Calvinism or, or people within Calvinism that think like, oh, well, I'm the elect, right? Look at, look at me, you know? Um, and that, that elevates people, and that is exactly the opposite of what any of these movements started off trying to be or do. Right? None of these movements started off with, I'm going to give these Christians a way to be better than other Christians. Right? That's not the point. That's how we as fallen people manipulate them to our own end. Right? Um, let's talk about this. We're still on last week. so we, uh, we, And I think we've talked about this. Glorification, and, and Thorson talks about this in the book, has two components. First, God is glorified through us. Uh, oh, I erased already. Primarily through us being justified and us increasing in sanctification, right? Um, then when we do these things, then God gets credit for them and that increases his glory, right? And then the other way is how we as believers will share in the glory of God. Uh, primarily in heaven, right? Uh, Paul talks about if we suffer with Christ, we'll be glorified with Christ, right? Which I don't, I'm not going to pretend like I understand what that means, right? But something will happen to us in heaven that changes us fundamentally to make us united with Christ in glory, right? Not just by being put in a right standing before God, not just being holy, being separated, being um, you know, without sin before God, somehow we will share in glory with God. And I don't know what that means. Go ahead. This is a little off topic, okay. but not like too much. Um, I heard that in heaven there's like levels. Like um, like in hell, you know, there's levels of like hell. In heaven there's like, <laughs> I see, there's like mm -hmm. levels to heaven. What are, your thoughts are, <laughs> what are your thoughts on the whole? You need a whole new board for that one. So, let's learn about... Um, well, it's been a pretty high topic lately that I've been seeing circling, like, social... Like, the stuff that I'm interested in. Yeah. It's been a big topic, so... Um, so, this is, you know, medieval Latin poetry. Um, <laughs> are you talking about... Like, um, you guys know Dante? I was just say Dante's Inferno, yeah. right? So Dante wrote three epic poems. The most famous of them is Dante's Inferno. And then he also wrote, um, I'm sure it's Purgatorio or something. And then Paradiso. Dante's Inferno is famous. Um, this, uh, this work, which is a, 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 it, it's an epic poem. So it reads, uh, not how we would understand a poem, but it's, it's prose, it's lines, um, and it's, it's lengthy. It's very long. And in the story, um, the poet Virgil leads Dante down into the depths of hell. And in hell, there are seven circles, right? Depending on how bad you were. So on the outside, there are like, Slothful people, lazy people. They didn't do bad stuff, but they didn't do anything, right? And so in the story, 
the people are punished in a way that fits their crimes, right? So I think, if I remember, like, the, the really slothful people are, like, stuck in mud or something forever, right? For eternity, they're kind of just, like, stuck in this muddy, slimy ooze they can't get out. As you get further and further in, it gets worse and worse. There's a circle in here for suicides. In Dante's Inferno, there's a circle of people who kill themselves. You go further and further in, there's circles for murderers, there's circles for whatever else. In the very center of the circle, anybody know? I can't remember. The worst three people in human history, according to Dante, are, are Judas, and then Brutus, and whatever his name is, the other guy that betrayed Caesar. So the inner circle are uh, traitors. The guy who betrayed Jesus and the guys who betrayed Caesar. Their punishment is that Satan exists in this inner circle as a three-headed dragon, and the three-headed dragon is constantly eating them. So he's like biting their head off, and then their head grows back. And then he's biting their head off again, and it grows back over and over and over for eternity. Have you guys seen Pirates of the Caribbean? The original Curse of the Black Pearl, Pirates of the Caribbean? They reference this. He says something about um, the inner circle of hell is reserved for backstabbers and mutineers. He's referencing this, right? You didn't think Jack Sparrow was, you know, was, was up on his medieval <laughs> Latin poetry. Um, this is what he's talking about. Purgatorio, obviously, is a, is a whole separate poem about purgatory. And this is where, I mean, he really develops the idea of purgatory. He also wrote Paradisia, which is, I don't, I don't know if Virgil's involved. I think it's a woman, uh, and I can't remember her name, who takes Dante into the heights of heaven. And it's the same sort of structure where there are levels of heaven. Um, this is where we get the idea. I don't know that we get it from the Bible of levels of heaven, of, um, you know, people who were saved, but, like, saved right before they died or never really did anything or down here, and then other people who are better and better get higher up. I don't know that we have those conceptions of, like, you know, oh, you're in the first layer of heaven, the third layer, the seventh. I don't think we think in those terms because um, I don't think it's biblical. Jesus talks about rewards in heaven. He talks about, like, um, you're going to have a mansion, Right in heaven, he's building them for you. Um, he talks about a lot of stuff that doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. Right, streets paved with gold. Well, that doesn't make any sense to me because gold is a physical material, right? And so it's not literally gold. It's not like AU on the on the elemental scale. Um, but somehow the metaphor of being made with gold reflects the reality of what's in heaven. Does that make sense? Um, it does seem like there's some sort of people who do more in terms of sanctification, in terms of works or whatever else, receive more rewards in heaven. And I have no idea what that looks like. Um, there's a lot of stuff about like the future where I'm like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what any of this looks like. Um, I think the way, the way I understand it, um, the Bible talks about martyrs, and martyrs receiving a special place in heaven. Um, the, the description of the place, is anybody know? It's under the throne of God. So, like, I picture, um, I mean, picture like a big worship service, a big sanctuary, right? The martyrs don't even have chairs. They're, 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 they're on the stage. Like, they're, they're not on the stage. They're, they're on the altar that we have kind of at the foot of the stage. They're that close, right? Um, and people who maybe didn't do as much or got saved, you know, right before they died or whatever else, they might be up in the, like, the extra seating up top, the balcony, right? Everybody still has equal access to God. Everybody still sees God. But some people are, some people have special access. Some people are closer, right? Maybe that's how it works. I don't know. Go ahead. So when you're talking about Catholicism with uh, saints and everything, do they look at a level, possibly, of very easy being that, you know, someone's a saint and they're... Yes, because that's how um, that's how the saints are uh, affected when you pray to them within Catholicism. Oh. So if you pray to such and such a saint about your fishing trip, right, so-and-so is the patron saint of fishing. I don't know who it is, but there is one. Um, you're going on a fishing trip on Saturday. You pray to such and such a saint. The reason that that's effective is because that saint is closer to God and has God's special ear for fishing, 
And so he knows the right words to pray for to help you get a, get a better fish. I don't go fishing, so I don't know the... My wife used to Anthony all the time when she was right. something. So it's the right. patron right. The patron saint of lost things. Yes. St. Anthony, St. Anthony. And orphans and something else, yeah. Um, and so the idea is that those people know the right way to pray for those topics. But they see those people higher in heaven than them when they get there. Yes. Closer to God and therefore more effective in praying on your behalf. In the same way that, like, we all have friends. We all, if we struggle with something, we get a friend to pray for us. But do you want to ask your friend who just got saved yesterday to pray for you for this really big struggle? Or do you want to ask your pastor to pray for you? You're going to ask your pastor because in your estimation, your pastor has a closer relationship with God than homeboy who just got saved yesterday. Right? Not, probably not even like close relationship though, like probably just, well, yes, because they've developed, like when you know how to pray, mm -hmm. there's like specific things that can unlock. So, yeah. yeah, it's just experience in praying, really. But I have a lot of people come to me and ask to pray because they don't think they're worthy enough. That their prayers their aren't going to be heard, so they come to me all the time. Which That's was Luther's emphasis on the priesthood of all believers to say we are all priests in the order of Melchizedek, or whatever it is, the terminology that Luther would use. And therefore, we all have access to God equally, Yeah. right? Um, but there is still some reality to, there are people that I will ask to pray for me, and there are people that I won't, yeah. right? Um, and so Catholicism takes that to the extreme to say, there are people in heaven that I'll ask to pray for me for specific <laughs> issues. And that's why, we talked about at the beginning, the, the necessity of miracles for them to achieve sainthood. The miracles prove that they're in heaven. Because you can't pray to dead people because they might be in hell. But Mother Teresa performed miracles after she died and therefore proved that she is in heaven. Right? That's, that's the, the. I mean, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, that's. Because we, we pray to like Jesus. Okay, I'm just making sure. Because we pray to Jesus. I mean, we believe in general admission, too. That's what I'm thinking of. Right. Wrong. And we also right. believe that Jesus is our intercessor. Right. Yeah. right. Hebrews yeah. talks about him being the only intercessor. So I don't need somebody else to pray for me. Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't need somebody else in heaven to speak to God on my behalf. I have Jesus to do that. Um, the way that I've heard it described, I grew up in southern Louisiana, so everybody's Catholic, so everybody has their understandings of it. One person who I think is probably a believer, probably has a relationship with Christ, also a Catholic, she described it as, um, you know, your prayer is like this beat-up apple, and you give it to Mary and she will polish it and clean it up for you best she can and then give it to Jesus for you. She makes it she makes it better before she gives it to Jesus. I'm like, yeah, I don't I don't think so. I think the Holy Spirit does that in me yeah. and then gives it to Jesus who respond who gives it to God. But Jesus right. wants our fruits back. Right. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. And so it's just a it's just a fundamental yeah. difference in yeah, the, whole, the whole verse in Revelation where it's talking about the prayers of the saints being in like the uh, being held in the open I can't remember the exact term yeah. Yeah. they use, but like I don't know. It just makes no sense to me that the one who justified us instantaneously through our belief in him wouldn't be able to handle our bruised apples. Right. <laughs> well, well, in the Old Testament, the only thing that was accepted was the best, the pure the absolute the yeah, but then he died on the cross. Right. And he died on the cross. And he with blood. Yeah. 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 So now but, it's, I mean, to say so that the so apple has to be polished before it can be presented to God is a little bit like saying about what you're writing about. You have to wear the right clothes before you yeah. can stand before God. Yeah. And again, you're saying the like apple just works, becomes kind of. the same as the clothes. Yeah. It's like an extra step that they want. Oh, we have to pray to Mary, and then it goes like, no, it's it. it's, it's so also, much more how are they going to enjoy their rewards in heaven if they constantly have to listen to your prayers? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and that yeah, is not a reward. From, from a, <laughs> to be fair, from a Catholic perspective, I think they would say none of us feel obliged when yeah. somebody asks us to pray for them, right? If one of you yeah. came, if one of you came to me and said, "Hey, I'm having this issue. Would you pray for me?" I would feel honored. Yeah. Right. And if God answered that prayer, I would feel closer to God because mm -hmm. you brought that request to me. And so I think they would say it's the same situation for saints in heaven, that they feel honored by your request and they feel more connected with God 
by watching God respond to your request because they can see what God is doing, right? And so I, I would say, I think for them, for Catholics, they would say that the saints in heaven are not obligated. They don't feel like it's a, a weight or a distraction from God. It increases their relationship with God because they see God responding to the prayers that they've brought to him or something like that. So do you, not, you don't think they're like held in judgment until we all get judged one day? Like you think the saints are really alive? Like let's just take it from the Catholic point of view. Yeah. They believe that when you die, you go straight to heaven and you're, you're connected. Uh -huh. Isn't there like a waiting room? Not like a waiting room, but don't we all kind of like... No, 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 not that this is a, no. Suspended animation. Not that. <laughs> so there are arguments that um, yeah. when we die, we're asleep until the apocalypse. That's what everyone And then everybody goes to heaven together. Judgment. I don't really buy that. No? Um, I mean, when Jesus is on the cross, he tells homeboy next yeah. to him, I'll sleep. <laughs> you and me will be eating together tonight in heaven. Right. I guess I just assume that like you're still like dead until he wakes us all up for for like the very last time he comes. The way I understand it, um, when we die, right now, our souls are separated from our bodies. Okay. Our souls go to heaven okay. immediately upon our death. Same with hell. You think same with hell? Yes. Yeah. And in the in the end, whenever Jesus comes back and restores everything our souls will be reunited with our bodies. I think that's the change that will happen in the new heaven and new earth or whatever the end times, however you understand it, is that we will receive our glorified bodies, which will look like us somehow, right? Jesus still has the scars and stuff, but he still looks like himself somehow. Um, but our souls will be reunited. But I do think our souls go to heaven when we die, oh, pretty, pretty instantaneously. But our body doesn't, and then you're saying, like, what do you think God comes back then? Our bodies. Oh, that's okay. Right. Yeah, I hear you. Um, okay. And then, I'm not sure about hell. I think our souls go to hell instantly. Um, and then I'm not sure if your body goes to hell or if your body ceases to exist. Mm -hmm. Like, in the end. I don't know. Um, Why would we get a body and they don't get a body? Because we're in heaven. Because it's a glorified body. Right? It's a right? new heaven and a new um, so there's stuff about like the, the people that are in hell, they're cast into the lake of fire and whatever else. Um, and so I'm not sure how that works, obviously, because I don't, I'm not God. Um, <laughs> but I think that's the way that I understand it. Because there, Jesus talks about hell being conscious, right? There, there's weeping and there's not, people are aware of what's going on to them. But I don't know that you need a physical body for that. Um, and I don't know that the physical body being returned to them is helpful or not. I don't know. Um, good. All right, Tiffany should have been here for that because she's talking about, I guess she's not talking about hell anymore. She's talking about evil. Yeah. Okay, let's move on. Uh, this is this week's topic because we just now only finished with last week. Um, so this is what we're going to be, again, we're reading most of this in the textbook. So we don't need to get bogged down. It's in our textbook. I don't like lecturing on stuff that we're reading because then it's just duplicating everything. Uh, so we'll, we'll go through this kind of quickly. Um, if my computer will work. Uh, so, um, spirituality is kind of like a, I don't know, a catch-all phrase. It means a lot of stuff to a lot of different people. Um, it's particularly popular outside of Christianity, or like, oh, I'm not, I'm not religious, I'm spiritual. You heard people say this, like, a ton. Um, yeah. Eastern religions will say this a lot, like, I'm not a religious person, I'm spiritual, right? I'm in touch with, you know, my karma, or Zen, or whatever. Um, but within Christianity, this has a lot to do with sanctification. So this is why we're talking about it after we're about sanctification. Um, the idea of, of growing spiritually, of being formed, right, spiritual formation, is, is working on the process of sanctification that we were just talking about. Um, this seems to me more, um, I mean, they're called disciplines. It seems more structured than just like willy-nilly, hopefully I'll get better next month than I was last month, right? This seems much more, no, I'm going to practice these things, and they're going to help me to become you know, more spiritual, we would say more sanctified. 
they will help me to get closer to God through these practices. Um, Thorsten separates them into abstinence or engagement. So this is retreating from stuff. Um, we would say retreating from things that are distracting you. So solitude, silence, fasting, these are all retreating from things, right? Uh, or disciplines of engagement, engaging in things, activating yourself, being more of a participant in whatever it is. Um, yeah, I don't have much more to say about that. Uh, mm -hmm. These, if you think of um, the seven deadly sins, those are kind of famous, mm -hmm. right? Um, I can't think of them off the top of my head. Lust, pride, greed, greed uh, gluttony, 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 hate, uh, sloth. Um, these, specifically, particularly within Catholicism, they're seven holy virtues. And they counteract the seven deadly sins, right? And this spirituality is practiced to, to raise those up, to cultivate those, to practice doing them in order to combat sin, right? Um, here it is, cardinal virtues, that's what they're called. So these seven cardinal virtues specifically counteract seven deadly sins. This is, a, 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 I mean, a Catholic understanding of it. Um, but... Exhibiting these virtues, working on them, and building them up are specifically designed to fight against sin. Um, I'm pretty sure they have it organized. Uh, if you practice this, you could fight against this sin, and it's kind of a one-to-one. -one. I don't remember the, the correlation off the top of my head. But they are all dispositions. They're all habits, qualities that we work on to help us to focus on what is right and good and holy. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Good. I feel like most of us are at least generally aware of most of this sort of stuff. Um, particularly within Catholicism, a lot of spirituality it revolves around the sacraments. We talked about the sacraments before, but participating in the sacraments helps you develop those virtues, right? Whether it's love or wisdom or temperance or whatever. But being a participant uh, is part of growing spiritually and growing morally. So you've got the sacraments, which are kind of what you do all the time. And then you've got liturgy, which is either the weekly service, how the service rolls, or like the, the liturgical calendar, right? Christmas falls on this time, and then uh, after that is King's Day, which is a specific day of the year. And then after King's Day starts, um, I mean, carnival season, right? And carnival season lasts until Ash Wednesday. And then Ash Wednesday is 40 days until Easter. And then 50 days after Easter is Pentecost. And you keep going and it builds the calendar, right? Which connects all of kind of the, the holidays. And so this liturgical calendar is built around that. And the whole system is in order to keep you in and keep you growing in spirituality keeping you to grow more virtuous and more moral and whatever else. Good? I think this is probably more foreign to us. I don't know why I can't... Uh, I think my computer didn't like that I switched slideshows. So it is... It's not letting me look out at all the text. Um, so that was sacramental. So that was kind of corporate, organized, calendar, spirituality. This is contemplative, so this is more solitude, prayer, reflection, growing on your own, not as the church doing the liturgical calendar. Um, within Catholicism, uh, <laughs> contemplative spirituality includes things that we are not familiar with, like icons. Does anybody know what an icon is? Anybody? An idol, almost. It, uh, it's an image. It's, it's a representative of it. Yeah. So an icon is an image used to um, invigorate, encourage worship. You don't worship the icon, but the icon helps you to worship Jesus better. Uh, Greek Orthodox, Orthodox in general, do this. Um, it's a big. It's part of what caused the split in 1054 between Roman Catholics on the West and Greek Orthodox in the East. Is icons. Um, so icons are kind of the Orthodox use of. Uh, icons are used by the Orthodox to help them focus on God. And in the same way in the West, Catholics have Mary. 
which again, you don't worship Mary, but Mary helps you worship God better. Right? Um, and Mary is the, yeah, the, the saint of all saints. She's the, the cream of the crop in terms of sainthood. I don't know the cream of the crop is the terminology. <laughs> Um, other forms of this spirituality, again, I think this might be a little foreign to us, although since we've been reading this, we have been believers, we are hopefully becoming more familiar with this sort of stuff, where um, this form of spirituality would say, because I've been changed by Christ, I'm going to respond not just by preaching the gospel to other people, but by helping other people. Right? That I can offer you a meal and feed you and take care of you and not have to force like a gospel presentation in that interaction. That I can love you as a human being without you accepting the gospel. Right? And so they would argue this, this was entirely Jesus' ministry. Jesus' ministry was going around and helping people. Feeding them and performing miracles and whatever. And then he would go somewhere else. And people would follow him if they wanted to hear teaching from him. But he didn't say, hey, you've got to sit through this church service and then I'll feed you. Or then I'll cure your leprosy or whatever it is. Right? So they would say, that's how Jesus functions. That's how we should function. So they would say, um, fighting oppression, changing societal, government, economic structures, um, becoming political activists, doing all of these things to change society in order to benefit the poor, the oppressed, the marginalized, whoever. That is a form of spirituality. Because you do that in response to the gospel changing you. Does that make sense? I think this is probably different than what we're used to. Because we're used to, well, God changed me, so I'm going to go and tell other people about the gospel. I'm going to go and preach the gospel. I'm going to evangelize people. They would say, this is evangelization. This is being Jesus to other people, loving other people in the way that Jesus did. Right? And if they want to ask questions about why are you doing this, or why are you so kind to me, or whatever it is, then you can have the gospel conversation. But that the gospel conversation is not a necessary component of helping people have better lives. Good? And then this is what we were talking about. Um, evangelical, what does evangelical mean? Like in the root sense of the word. Right. So evangelicalism, which has become kind of a political term now, you know what I'm talking about? Right. Evangelicals vote for so and so, or they believe so and so. That's it's a destruction of the word. The word means that these people believe that it's necessary to evangelize, which means evangelicals believe people who are not Christian will not go to heaven. So it is necessary to evangelize. Right. So this form of spirituality is. Increasing in our relationship with God by telling other people about Him. Right? So we go and evangelize, we tell other people about God, and that increases our understanding of God also. It's a way to practice our spirituality by telling other people about Him. Right? Um, study, I mean, this is what we're doing in this class, right? Is committing our minds to understanding more about God and exhibiting our spirituality in that way and growing closer to God by conforming our minds and submitting them under the Bible in order to learn and grow closer to him. Right? This, in my estimation, is a lot of people don't like this. A lot of people in evangelical circles do not like this. Because they will say, well, the gospel is easy to understand. The gospel is simple. And if you try to work on it too much, if you try to add too much or do too much or think too much, you're going to think yourself out of it. Right? You don't need a PhD in order to understand the gospel. So, you just go and preach the gospel to people. You tell them about Jesus, and we're good. Um, so what did they do with the study to show thyself approved? I mean, I would say, like, when Jesus says, love the Lord God with all your heart and mind mm -hmm. and soul and strength, your mind is a component of that. Um, that tendency is not unique to evangelicalism. It's kind of an American understanding, like a distrust for the educated, you know what I'm talking about? Like, what kind of, as Americans, generally speaking, as a populist country, we tend to distrust authorities and, you know, ivory towers. That's what ivory towers means, right? Is, 
people who are well-educated, right? People who go to Ivy League schools and are up in their ivory towers thinking about nonsense. I mean, rightfully so to some degree. Sometimes, yeah. I'm looking at um, how the, the church got influenced by the white males. So, yeah. uh -huh. so, and I mean, there's parts of this that are that are unnecessary, right? There's, uh, I think we talked about this, the, the big hot topic in the Middle Ages was if you hold up a pin, how many angels can dance on the head of this pen? Right? And people would like excommunicate each other over this argument of, theologically speaking, how many? Because um, I guess they had different answers. I don't know. Um, so obviously it's, it's taken to an extreme. But I, I also think that this is very important. And, and I assume that since you all are in this class, you would agree that it's important. Yeah. Um, but be aware that there are lots of folks in our congregations who don't value this or think that um, by studying too much, you'll be corrupted out of your faith, right? Um, so it's just something to be aware of, that, that generally speaking, in America generally, and within evangelical Christianity specifically, this is uh, contentious. It's not always assumed to be a positive thing. My mom, to some degree, like when I was telling her about like everything I'm learning. Yeah. Granted, she, I'm not always good at reverberating back what I'm learning, but to some degree, she was like, "Oh my gosh, be careful because why do you need to know all this?" Because <laughs> like she said, the Bible is so easy. I'm like, yeah. it's really not though. Like when you go back, there can be so much. And so yeah. it's like, yeah, I can watch the show, but I really want to be a part of the fandom. Yeah. So I, I guess some people don't, you know, my mom's like 60-something, so she just... It's different. Yeah. She's not against it, she just, you know, yeah. she's... No, I understand. Yeah. Um, and then holiness, I think we've talked about this. Uh, I acknowledge So, monastic living is big, which means um, monks and nuns, monasteries, right, solitude. Um, but this idea of pursuing holiness through those sorts of activities, taking vows of silence, vows of poverty, or whatever else, um, by by expressing your spirituality in this way. Any questions on that? 